I think it's really important to establish from the outset that tonight this is a Bible talk and it's certainly not a political talk. And I think it's really important to establish that right from the start because of everything that's going on at the minute with um, the, the hostilities between Israel and Palestine um, and how closely they're tied in, I guess, to this topic and particularly to Abraham. So the, the stance we're taking tonight it is not um, an opinion, it is not my opinion, it's not anyone else's opinion, but it's just uh, what the Bible says. And so I want to present that to you uh, this evening and then leave you with your own opportunity to make up your own mind uh, on this contentious subject um, on how you feel about that, whether you agree with the Bible or not. But first of all, I suppose we ought to spend some time setting the scene. And why are we asking this question about Abraham? Well, Abraham is everywhere we look, certainly from a religious perspective, but also a political perspective. Um, this photo is just from last year, August last year. And it's a picture of the signing of the Abra Abraham Accords. And the Abraham Accords are a joint statement between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and the United States of America. Like I say, this picture was taken just last summer. Uh, subsequently, this term, the Abraham Accords, was is now used to refer collectively to agreements between Israel um, and other Arab countries, so like Bahrain, for example. And what the Abraham Accords are, a, a treaty of peace between what are considered primarily Islamic countries and the Jewish state of Israel. And that's sort of um, piggybacked on by the United States. The United States is primarily a Christian country. But why are they called the Abraham Accords? Well, just as a hint, it's, it's to do with the different religions that we've already mentioned today. And if you're anything like me, when you have a question, the first thing you might do is go to Google to find the answer. And so that's what I did. I went and had a look and I did the research for you. And I just searched in who was Abraham. And the first website that took me to was uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. And then that gives us a nice summary that we're just going to go off just for a minute or two to have a look at Abraham. A lot of information there, so let's break that down. So firstly, uh, Abraham, or in the Hebrew, Avraham, was originally called Abram, or in Hebrew, Avram. And he flourished in the early second millennium, um, so about uh, 4,000 years ago or so, uh, the first of the Hebrew patriarchs, and is a figure revered, revered sorry, by the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And the word monotheist means mono one, so one God, people who believe in one God. So Judaism, Christianity and Islam all stem back to Abraham. According to the biblical book of Genesis, Abraham left Ur in Mesopotamia. And that's actually what we read in our opening reading, um, which Jared read for us. So he left the land of Ur um, because God called him to found a new nation in an undesignated land that he later learned was Canaan. So what's now considered the land of Israel. He obeyed in, question, in questioningly the commands of God from whom he received repeated promises and a covenant. A covenant means a promise or a vow before God that his seed would inherit the land. And so that's a, a basis of Abraham. And we can see that in the Bible. And we started to read some of that account today. In Judaism, the promised offspring is understood to be the Jewish people descended from Abraham's son, Isaac, born of his wife, Sarah. And this is where we start to get some differences. So for Jews, they believe that the promises are all about the Jewish people. However, Christians... In Christianity, the genealogy of Jesus is traced to Isaac and Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac is seen as a foreshadowing of Jesus's sacrifice on the cross. And what we're going to see is that 
the Christian view and the Christian understanding from the biblical perspective is that the promises point forward to Jesus. And then finally, in Islam, it is Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn son, born of Hagar, who is viewed as the fulfillment of God's promise. And the prophet Muhammad is his descendant. And consequently, these three main religions are known as the Abrahamic religions. And Abraham is then seen as a pioneer and a patriarch of faith for three of the world's major religions. And this makes, if you like, Abraham a spiritual father of over half the world's population, over four billion people. And that study taken um, in 2015 sort of highlights that. So the percentage you can see of Christians, Muslims and Jews um, will consider over half of the population uh, of the world. And they would consider Abraham a, a spiritual father or spiritual patriarch, a, a forerunner. Which is why we're so familiar with his name today. Now, because these different religions all trace themselves back to Abraham and have similar ground which they see as holy, um, that causes a constant form of contention between the different religions. And particularly nowadays, this is really between Israel, well, the Jews and uh, the Islamic people. Whether it's Israel, whether we call it Palestine, or perhaps people might refer to it as the Holy Land. It's a place of great significance for all three Abrahamic religions is Israel. Because all of these people have in the past or do continue to seek control of this place in order to worship. Since the early Crusades, Jerusalem is as war-torn now as it has been since AD 70, when the, when the Romans overturned the city. And following the atrocities of World War II, the Jews longed for a place to call home. And many places were offered, but the religious importance of Israel could not be overlooked for the Jews. 1948 saw the establishment of the State of Israel causing absolute uproar for those living in Palestine and for the Arab countries around. And consequently today, the land is divided and its hostilities and unrest have grown to new levels in this past month, with rockets being uh, shot from across the border from both sides. But since Israel are a much more advanced nation, the casualties across the border have been much more severe. And recently, America have become involved once again to try and find a way to find temporary peace or at least a ceasefire. And at the heart of so much of the fighting is Jerusalem. Uh, both Jews and Muslims want Jerusalem for themselves and are prepared to fight over it. Interestingly, America, um, a Christian country, have become involved too most recently. So again, you've got this overlap of all the three Abrahamic religions. Jerusalem is considered the holiest city in the world because it is revered by all three Abrahamic religions so highly. For the Jews, one of the main reasons is because this was the city of David, where David reigned. For Christians, this was, of course, the place of the crucifixion of Christ. But for Muslims, this is where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And so you can get a grasp of just how important it is for all three of these religions. Although it doesn't make the news as often, Jerusalem isn't alone in being regarded as a holy city. Hebron is also considered uh, in some ways just as holy. Because in Hebron, there is a tomb upon which is built a cave. Sorry, a, a tomb which is built upon a cave. And this cave is believed to be the cave of Machpelah. The cave of Machpelah, according to the Bible, is the cave where Abraham was buried. And depending on whether you read the Bible or whether you read the Quran, if you read the Bible, you'd also recognise that this is also where Sarah, Abraham's wife, was buried. Isaac, his son, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, and also Jacob's 
wife Leah. So it's incredibly significant for Jews for that reason. Because of their ties to Abraham, Christians, Jews and Muslims alike hold this place in great reverence. And in fact, over 300,000 people visit here every single year. So what about the family of Abraham? Well, Abraham had two wives, Sarah and Hagar. And the Bible and the Quran portray the relationship and the role of these two women very differently. Whether in the Bible, Sarah is seen as the original wife of Abraham, whereas Hagar is the handmaid of Sarah originally. But when Abraham couldn't have children with Sarah, Hagar was given so that they could keep the family name alive and the intention was to fulfill the promises. And in turn, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Later on, still following the Bible record, Sarah had a child with Abraham. But the problem was Hagar and Ishmael. And as a consequence, they had to flee to Egypt for their safety. Now, actually, in the Quran, this story is somewhat reversed. Um, and the, the portrayal of Sarah is quite negative, whereas in the Bible, the portrayal of Hagar and Ishmael is quite negative. But the Bible is quite clear that in the Bible, it betrays Isaac as the promised son. So when these promises, which we're going to read about, were made to Abraham, the Bible is quite clear that actually the intention was that it would be for Isaac to fulfill some of these promises. And the line would go through Isaac, not through Ishmael. But this dispute, which happened between Sarah and Hagar, was, if you like, the first dispute, which would turn out to be between Jew and Muslim. And the consequence of this family feud has had ripples which has shaped the world as we know it today. The descendants of Isaac in the Bible were the nation of Israel. The descendant of Ishmael in the Quran is recorded as the prophet Muhammad. So there's, if you like, again, is, is another indication to the significance of this relationship and the importance of Ishmael for Muslims and Isaac for both Jews and in turn for Christians, as we will see. But like I say, since this is a Bible talk, uh, what we're going to do from now on is we're just going to focus on uh, what the Bible actually says. And we're going to spend some time going through some of the promises. But first of all, if we were to read through all the chapters in Genesis, which told us about Abraham, these are some of the things which we'll be able to pull out. So as I've already mentioned, Abraham left the land of Ur with his family. God spoke to him and asked him to leave his family and go to a land that I, God, will show you. And because he did this in faith, he was rewarded with various promises by God. And one of those involved the changing of his name from Abraham, which means exalted father, to Abraham, meaning father of many nations. Um, and that ties in with one of the promises we're going to look at. So let's just go through and have a look at these promises. So all these are in Genesis. So if you've got your Bible open, um, you might want to have a look at it yourself. So the first promise that we've got, and actually one that we've already read, is in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, Genesis chapter 12 Verse 2 reads, well, we start with verse 1. And the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And if he does this, this was going to happen. I will bless. Sorry, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And just in these couple of verses, there's four main parts of this promise which are pulled out. And some of the later promises sort of revert back to these and offer more details. So just looking at those key principles on the right, which I've drawn out. So the first one was that Abraham and his descendants would become a great nation. Abraham would become a great name. And actually, if you like, to an extent, that one certainly come true, isn't it? 
God would bless those that bless him and curse those that curse him. And then in Abraham, all nations would be blessed. So they're the key take home messages from that first promise. Next promise we get is just a very small one in verse seven. Still in the same chapter in chapter 12. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And we can see from verse five, for example, that he's actually in the land of Canaan and the land of Canaan, um, which we now know as the land of, of Israel. But if you weren't convinced with that, there's some more details about that land later on. So that's the next point, that Abraham's children would inherit the land of Canaan. Uh, the next promise we've got is a couple of, well, the next chapter, chapter 13 and verse 14 to 17. And I'm, I'm going to read through that. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. And I will make of your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. There's a few extra points there. Um, so we've already got the idea that he's going to inherit the land and his offspring will inherit the land. But the key thing here that we've not seen yet at the end of that first verse, verse, um, verse 15, it will be given to his offspring forever. And when the Bible talks and makes promises about things lasting forever, it means forever. And that's not something which we're confident has happened yet, because although Israel are in the land now, and we're going to see that actually later on, these promises do in some ways uh, apply to Israel that they're certainly not concrete in that and, and it's the land isn't theirs as, as it was promised, uh, certainly not to the extent it was promised to Abraham. Um, and then the second part of this that I'd like us to take away is that his seed would be multitudinous. So it'd be innumerable. It cannot be measured. Uh, if you flick forward two chapters, we've got another promise given to Abraham. So chapter 15. And this time, um, God actually makes a covenant with him. And he sort of re-emphasizes some of the things that he's, he's talked about before in this promise. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 15. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring, I will give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, to the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergeshites, and the Jebusites. All this land that we're going to inherit. But the main two points of reference that we have are all the way down from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. I'm just thinking, do we have a map? We have a map here. So all this land from right from the bottom of Egypt all the way up to this river Euphrates was going to be the land of Israel as it's known. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor on the screen, but currently Israel have only got sort of this section of land here, whereas the promise was all the way down, all the way to the top. Okay, and finally, the last promise we're gonna consider is chapter 22, Genesis 22, verse 17 to 18. Uh, I'm going to start reading from verse 15, actually. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn and declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. So a couple of points to bring out here. Um, 
the offspring was going to be multiplied and this time it's compared to the stars and not compared to the dust. So again, this enneable concept. Um, and then in the second part, the offspring shall possess the gate of uh, his enemies. So the power and control that his, his offspring were going to have control. And then finally, in his offspring, all will be blessed. And there's an interesting point here to make that the word offspring, and we're going to see later on, offspring could be used in a singular sense or also in a plural sense. Just like the word seed. So a lot of the older versions would use the word seed for his descendants, the seed of Abraham. And we're going to see actually that that is quite significant, that we have this idea that it could actually be plural, but actually it could be singular at the same time. And it's quite specific when it talks about this in the New Testament, which we'll see. And I guess we have to ask the question then, because some of these promises haven't yet come to pass, or at least not in the truest sense when it talks about things lasting forever. Who is this true seed of Abraham? Because the contentions that we have are between uh, Muhammad, so the Muslims would state that this is perhaps speaking of Muhammad. Jews would speak that this is actually speaking of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, so the children of Israel. And then Christians would say that this is bespeaking uh, a future fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Well, since this is a Bible talk, if you were to read the whole Bible, the idea that the true seed of Abraham is actually unavoidably Jesus Christ. And actually the New Testament starts with this principle, the very first verse in the New Testament, um, which God has picked. Out of all the verses God could have started the New Testament with, he chose this verse. Um, Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 reads, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And why it's important that those two are mentioned is because just like tonight we're talking about promises that were given to Abraham, there's also promises which were given to David speaking about his seed. And it's like the Bible is crying out to us and saying, Jesus is this seed which is being spoken about. Now, at the time in the life of Jesus, the Jews didn't want to accept that because Jesus tried to impose changes and said the way the Jews were doing things wasn't the way that God actually intended and just like today, the Jews don't, we didn't, back in those days, accept Christ as the Messiah. But if you read the Bible and the New Testament as well, it's really, really clear. So Matthew 1, we learn, firstly, that it, Jesus is a direct descendant of Abraham. And it wants us to, to know about this, to make this connection. In Galatians chapter 3, Okay, so Galatians chapter 3, and the, the first reference we're going to take from Galatians 3 is verse 16. We're going to jump forward and back in this argument, which the Apostle Paul is creating, is writing to the Galatians. Um, Galatians 3, verse 16, Paul writes, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, or if you've got a different version, it might say seed. It does not say to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And so if we're going to be following what the Bible says, and we're going to be using the Bible to make up our own opinion about Abraham, we can't really get away from the idea that when it speaks of the seed, it's speaking of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we also have a different book, the book of Romans. The book of Romans was written to people who were alive just after the time of Jesus. So people who were responding to the Christian message, if you like, the gospel message. And the book of Romans really is written to Gentiles. And Gentiles is just a fancy way of saying non-Jewish people. So people who had heard the, uh, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the gospel was that Everybody can be saved. The good news is what it means. So before Jesus came along, the teaching for salvation was that you had to follow the law. 
the law of Moses. You had to be a Jew. And if you weren't a Jew, you had to convert to be a Jew. And in that conversion, you had to follow all the laws of Moses. But Jesus was saying that actually it's all about worshipping God, being baptised and doing good. And in so doing, you will fulfil the law. So Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. So he taught that you didn't have to be a Jewish person. You didn't have to follow the law of Moses to be saved. And so here in Romans 4, the writer is arguing that the seed of Abraham weren't chosen because of their heritage. Sorry, the seed of Abraham, so Jesus, wasn't chosen because of his heritage, but he was in fact chosen because of his faith and obedience. So Romans 4 reads, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring, his seed, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So we're saying here that you didn't, that Jesus wasn't the saviour of the world because he was uh, a descendant of Abraham, but actually he was the saviour of the world because of his faith, because of the righteousness of his faith and his actions. And that links in with what Abraham was all about. The promises were given to Abraham because he believed God and he acted on it. Faith and obedience. And if you're still in Galatians, the next verse we're going to look at in Galatians is verse 7. So Galatians 3, verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham as opposed to the people who are the lineage of Abraham, if you like. Know then that it is those of the faith of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, so the non-believers by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So what is telling us in this verse is that it's not about your lineage, but actually it's about having faith. Whether you're Jewish or whether you're a Gentile, if you have faith, then you can be blessed. Then you can be saved. And it's the idea that you are justified by faith. And that idea of being justified is quite an important one because it's the idea of being corrected. You're not perfect, so you're going to be made as though you are perfect in the eyes of God. So we've thought about, if you like, if I just flip back to the slides, the true seed of Abraham and who that would be. And we're establishing that it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen that there's a spiritual link, that being Gentiles, we can be put in, if you like, to, and, and we can be grafted in to that saving body of Jesus. But what about the natural seed? So the actual descendants of Abraham, are they just cast asunder? Are they just, are they just put to the side? And I guess the question is, what about the Jews? Aren't they God's people still? Well, yes, they are God's chosen people. But since Jesus came, everyone can be God's people. So yes, they are still God's people. But more importantly, because of Christ, Everybody can be God's people. And Romans 3 says, what then? Are we, Jew are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin as, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. So all need to be justified. There's that word. It says that just because they're Jews doesn't mean they don't sin. They're the same as Gentiles in that regard. Or what about Romans 9? Well, Romans 9 talks about how that there were many people who descended from Abraham, like Ishmael's descendants, for example, and they're not Jewish. So simply being able to trace your lineage back to Abraham does not mean that you're going to inherit the promises because that's missing the whole point of the Bible. And actually, the whole point of the promises, the promises were given to Abraham because he had faith and because he acted, not because of his genetic makeup. And then Romans 11, Romans 11 states that 
God didn't open salvation up to everyone through the sacrifice of Jesus because not because he didn't want to save the Jews, but actually he says the opposite. He says that he opened it up to everyone because he wants to make the Jews jealous so that they'll worship him more. He says that it'd be much better if the Jews were to embrace the New Testament and embrace Jesus Christ as the Messiah, because that's what God really wants. So let's read those verses, Romans 11, verse 11 and 12. So I asked, did they stumble? Did the Jews stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, through their sins, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? If in the sin of the Jews, I think here speaking truthfully about the crucifixion of Christ, if in that sin there is salvation for all people, how much better would it be, God is saying, if they too joined in that salvation? So what's the lesson for us? Well, if you're still in Galatians 3, come to the end of the chapter. And there's some fantastic verses. So Galatians 3, verse 26 says, uh, let's go to verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So because of our faith, we can be children of God. We can be the sons of God. For as many as you of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek or Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So in baptism, everyone is united, regardless of your race, or regardless of your gender. Verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. And what promises were those? So if we're baptised, what promises were those? Well, the promise on the left was what was told to Abraham. And on the right, that's how it would convert. So rather than Abraham becoming a great nation, we ourselves can be a part of that great nation. That's how that promise can be opened up to us. Uh, the fourth one down, in Abraham, all nations would be blessed. Through baptism, we can be blessed, regardless of our nation, regardless of our heritage, whether we're Jew or Gentile. Abraham's children will inherit the land of Canaan. Well, actually, that would inherit, that would translate to us inheriting the kingdom, being Abraham's heirs. His seed would be multitudinous, innumerable. And the grace of God through Jesus knows no limits. It's open to all people. And the last two, Abraham's seed will possess the gate of their enemies. And Abraham's seed, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. And if you are Christ's, the promise is that ultimately sin and death will be destroyed. In his seed, all will be blessed. In Jesus, all will be saved. And so I guess the final question we've got, I um, kind of can answer. What religion was Abraham? Well, Abraham was Jewish. But he would not follow Judaism as it is today. And why is that? Because he believed in the future promises. And not the Jews today, Abraham believed in the gospel. Abraham believed that all nations will be blessed in Jesus Christ. Like the disciples, the apostle Paul and all the early Christians that were once Jewish, Abraham would have followed the teachings of Jesus. Like the disciples, Abraham would have converted from Judaism and embraced the good news of the kingdom of God. And in time, would have been baptised into Jesus and would have taken on his saving name, as I hope you do too.
And to finish, I'd just like to read that last verse from 1 Corinthians 12. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Thank you.